Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to do a painting on some hot pressed paper and I have here the new Paul Rubens watercolor block. And it's very, uh, kind of very luxurious here. I think I'll actually save this um, kind of cover after I use up the um, the block and maybe make a journal from it because it's very, uh, very well made, luxurious and sturdy. So definitely not something I would want to dispose of when I was done. Um, you can remove this top sheet if you want, but the thing that's nice about it is it does keep your paper clean. And since this is a block, if you look on the edge, what you would do when you were done your painting, after you're done, don't take it off to paint on it. After you're done, you would slide a, uh, like a I like to use a butter knife. I find I have a way better luck with a, just a kitchen butter knife than I do a palette knife. And then you would just slide off that top sheet and your next sheet would be all fresh and ready to go. We're also gonna use the Paul Rubens watercolors, which come in this beautiful pink tin, which is I, I, so pretty, honestly. I haven't used the paints too much because um, they're a paint formulated without Oxgall and I usually prefer a paint that flows a little bit more. Here's the colors here so you can see them swatched out. But they are very affordable as far as artist quality paints go and um, there's just to give you an idea of the color saturation. The colors are nice and bright but if you want a color that's going to flow a little bit more then these probably won't be for you but if you find that you're using your watercolors on a lot of different services like unsized paper, art journals, if you do bible journaling, anything where you might not be using a sized watercolor paper. This is a nice um, kind of all-around set to have. So it's, it's a personal preference thing. Um, the, a lot of people say they remind them a lot of Holbein colors. I haven't used Holbein enough to say that you know they really remind me of Holbein, but but a lot of people do. Uh, so I'm going to start off. We're going to do a gold finch. I know I've done gold finches before. I've done them in watercolor and acrylic, but I really like them. And I'm going to draw a little bit darker than you ought to, just so that you can see them. I'm using a very inexpensive Dollar Tree <laughs> mechanical pencil, because quite frankly, it's the one I could reach from my chair. And put in the wing here. This is a very hard lead too, which uh, should reduce some smudging. Not that I really worry about it too much. Get the head. So I've got the head, I've got the belly. Belly and bum, you kind of see. Little tail in there. Got the leg here. And it's a very interesting perspective though. Looking at the negative space. And I like to put in the um, the legs before I put the branch in because it's so much easier to try to get a branch to fit where the legs are landing rather than put the branch and then hope your bird lands in the right spot. You know, it's just a, from a drawing standpoint, it's just a little easier to do it this way. Let's get the, get the beak in there and the eye. And I'm just going to make an indication of the dark area on the head. I think the wing could come down a little bit more. Okay, then we've got our, this, uh, the bird is on a cosmos branch. Those pretty, they're kind of, um, I don't really like daisies because their petals are wider, but they've got that kind of flat, flat flower shape to them. Another one up here. They're like a daisy, except the ends of the petals, the petals are wider and the ends are more blunt instead of pointed like a daisy petal. And the reference photo has one here, which means it will cover up a little bit of the wing and cover up most of the tail. The tail you're not really seeing that much anyway because of the foreshortening. But I am going to put that petal in there because I like that perspective. I like that he's nestled in the flowers. And I say he because He's really bright yellow, so it's probably a he and not a she. And I just like to put enough um, enough details so that I can paint and not kind of worry about um, messing anything up. I just want to kind of know where I'm going, have a plan as I'm painting this. And I think that's pretty much all I need. Now this is a hot press paper. I will link up to the different Paul Rubens blocks. There are, there are different sizes and cold press and hot press. This is my first time using the hot press. I have used the, um, the cold press before and it performed very well. One thing I noticed, <clears throat> pardon me, with the, um, with the Paul Rubens paints, and I, I don't know if it's because 
there is no ox skull in them. But I do notice, especially if I'm working wet into wet, like I'm going to be for this background, I notice a, a sh bigger shift from wet to dry. So when we go in and we put in the colors, we're going to be a little heavier handed than you might be if you're using a different brand that doesn't have as much of a shift. And it could be that these paints, maybe they don't have as much gum arabic, but they don't really have a chalky finish to them. Like if I look at this, there's no chalky finish. Um, in fact, in some really thick passages where I did a glaze, you can almost see a little bit of sheen. So it's almost so kind of um, indicative of more Eastern style watercolors. So I'm thinking the ox skull might have something to do with the um, with the luminosity of the paint as well. All right, so I just want an even sheen, no puddles. And I am going to start off, let's see, I think I'm gonna use some Prussian blue. My brush is uh, a little big for those little half pans. Isn't that pretty? Actually, I think that might be phthalo blue. You know what? I think it is. Let's see. I think Prussian's down here. The colors are so dark it's hard to see. Oh, very close. You know what? They're so very similar. But you can see when I do that, it's not like spreading crazy. So that might be something you like. It might be something you dislike. Everybody's different. Now I am going to try to avoid the bird, even though I've wet everything. Um, and I've talked about this before, how I like to, um, I don't like to have that cut and pasted look on my paintings. So I try to um, try to avoid that. I'm going to grab some sap green. And I'll try to kind of paint around the flowers a little bit. But I'm not, but because the colors don't have the ox skull, I don't have to worry quite so much about them bleeding uncontrollably. I like to have um, a little more natural of a look than have that, like, that's why I don't mask, that's why I wet the whole background and not just, you know, wet around the bird. I like to have that, um... I like to have that quality, and by using a big brush, it's also going to help me keep that nice, fresh look. Um, I'm looking at the goldfinch. I think I'm going to want some lemon yellow, so I'm going to go ahead and grab that now. I might use another yellow with it, but I try to start off and put as many of the colors that I think I'm going to want in the painting, and I try to get it in the background, so that way nothing feels um, discordant later on down the road. Everything feels natural, I should say. Now, you can see my structure lines here for the flowers. If that bothers you, you can obviously erase any of those um, extra lines before you begin painting. It doesn't bother me at all. I like being able to see those lines. Um, I think I'm going to grab some of this uh, warmer yellow. It's like a cad yellow deep. I'm going to add some of that here and there because I know I'm going to want some of that in my... Um, my bird as well, so just getting that in the background is nice. I'm gonna try mixing some greens. Oh, that's pretty, isn't it? That's that uh, warm yellow with the Prussian blue. Very pretty. Use all like sides of your brush. I like using a big brush so I don't get fussy at this stage, but you can use all different sides and get a lot of interesting effects that way. I also want to get some of the flower color in, which is like kind of like pinkish purple color. And I think I will go with this mauve color. I gotta be careful any place where I have yellow though, because it's going to want to get a little muddy on me. And I'm gonna grab a, whoops, oh no, I lost my swatch. Oof, that could have been bad. I need to get a paper towel just to blot a little bit. This rag will work. My paper towel's on the ground, and I'm kind of trapped here. I'm sitting at my desk because I've got a bar stool, and it's 
Uh, my legs are under the table. Luckily, I had a clean rag nearby. And I'm just going to go ahead and blot off some of the paint that's on the yellow area of the bird. And I can also go ahead and blot anything that I don't want that's all the flowers if I think it's going to cause me an issue. Because I plan on keeping this a transparent watercolor. And uh, another thing to keep in mind with when you're using hot press paper is that you're more likely to get blossoms, which is when, um, like right, right there, I kind of blotted it, but you kind of see where it was. Um, it's when you've got, I think I need a little bit of that reddish color. Um, you've got a puddle. Because the paper's so smooth, like I could see that one would be a, become a blossom. I added a little bit of that kind of rose color into my mauve. Um, it will sit on the paper because there isn't the texture to kind of stop everything from flowing everywhere. It will sit there and you will get a puddle. And it's often not what you want. <laughs> I think we've got all the colors in that we need. I'm just wondering if we might want a brown in here. Uh, so why don't I go ahead and grab some burnt sienna. I think that's a little bit livelier. And I just flick in a few just little uh, bits of I don't know, stems, branches, things like that. I don't want anything too specific just because uh, I'm not going to keep a sharp line with this. You can see it's already feathering out because my paper's wet, but just to get a little bit of texture. And also with this round brush, I think I want to do the same thing with the sap green. So my brush isn't sopping wet and I'm picking up the color from the pan. I'd like to tap it off just to make sure I don't have any like uh, big globs or anything, but I'm going to throw in some of these grasses here. Just not really grasses, just these kind of spiky, uh, spiky foliage. I think it's the, um, like those little leaves that kind of come by with the cosmos, you'll notice them growing kind of like off the same stems, the foliage part, and just help kind of frame the image and give our bird a nice little, uh, nice place to rest. All right, so this is at a point where I want to let it dry, so I am going to, I think I'll just let this air dry. I've got my cup of tea here, so I'm going to drink my cup of tea, and when we come back this will be dry and we can go and do our next layer. Okay, the background is dry, and we're ready to do our next layer. And I'm just going to use a, I think this is a yeah, number eight round synthetic. And I found the rag, this rag actually came with the watercolor set. And a lot of people think this rag is just to protect the set, like to make it look pretty and stuff. And maybe that's why they put it in there, but it's actually a really great rag for lifting and for blotting your brush. So that's what I use it for. But I totally understand if you want to, you know, keep your, <laughs> keep your paint set beautiful. I, I get that, but um, I prefer to use this because I am always, I always, I always, I never have a paper towel within reach, it seems like. I'm going to go in here and I am putting in the lightest bits of yellow that I see. Kind of my more cool yellow, the more lemony yellow on the bird. Uh, something I've been doing lately, I, I feel like I was pretty hard on these watercolors when I first got them. Uh, so something I've been doing recently is kind of taking stock and giving some paints another try that I was previously, I don't know, really hard on, but just not that impressed with. So, um, and I find that a lot of times if I, I don't know, maybe I was in a weird mood when I looked at them before, or, um, well, for whatever reason, they didn't like, they didn't wow me as much as they wowed other people. I'm kind of giving them another look and, you know, seeing how they, how they strike me after a bit. I've noticed that sometimes, and I've noticed also um, when a company comes out with paper and you use their, their paints with their paper, they often perform a little bit better because they've designed their paper to work with their paints. And I'm not sure if that's the case here, but, um, but I thought that would also give the paper a really good, you know, workout if I used it with their paints and saw how it, it went in that case. I'm going to grab a little bit of the burnt sienna here. Uh... And I need a little bit of blue, I think. And I'm going to kind of paint the bum area. I think it's got some like green reflections from all the plants and stuff around there. So I want to get that in. And I'm trying to, 
um, when I put my paint down, go with the direction of the feathers. By the way, if you want more uh, training on painting birds, I do have a lot of free YouTube tutorials. I also have a course on um, on on feathers, fe birds and feathers, feathers and fowl, and I'll link that down below if that's something that you would find helpful and interesting. I'm going to grab some of that rose color and add that in as well. I like to look for those subtle colors, and I like to work from colors I've already used. It just gives you more harmony. And when you layer up a bunch of colors, it tends to give you a nice texture. Also, see it's a little bit darker back here. Now I'm going to switch to a skinnier brush. It's weird having this. I I think I could probably fold the lid of this uh, block around the back, but I don't want to because I'm afraid I might... Um, I might stress the spine and it's such a pretty kind of like journal cover that and I want to make sure I can reuse it so I'm <laughs> being like kind of kind of babying it because I'm like this is going to be such a pretty cover for a journal after I'm done the watercolor paper and I suppose I could like if I wanted to keep these pages together I don't think I will but I suppose I could just well no I couldn't really unblock this end because you're you got to start it up there, so never mind. Forget that. Forget I even said it. Of course, I guess you could bind the pages and put it all back into a into a book. I also think it'd be a pretty tablet case. I don't know. It's just this. Sometimes you just see some packaging of a product, and it's like it just sparks so many different ideas. And that's kind of how the cover of this was. I, I definitely am not going to throw it away when I'm done and waste it. I'm going to use it or something. Now the other nice thing about paying attention to the shadows on the Goldfinch is that um, it really defines the form and if you've got some fuzzy edges or some background has bled into the bird, it it um, it sharpens it up so you don't have to worry about, about losing that detail. I am going to go back to that number 8 round because it's a little bit firmer and I'm going to mix the beet color and I'm going to use that warmer yellow. Use a little smidgen of that rosy red. I'm just going to go ahead and, and paint that beacon. I had too much paint on my brush. Now, in this situation, probably using the, um, if you look at the CAD red light there, I think that's what it is. Well, I, I do have my original swatches, came with a swatch card. Let's see if it's in English. Oh shoot, it's not in, in English. Pierre went away, I think, that's either, I think it's a cad red. Um, it's got a little more opacity to it, so if I did use that, because look at the warm yellow, it's quite transparent. That would give me a little bit more opacity, but I don't want to add that in this late in the game. There was nothing else I really wanted to have that color. I guess I could use it in flower centers or something. I might have to do that. I'm going to see how that does uh, because of the blue from underneath. It might just need some glazing, and that's all right. The but the the kind of telltale sign of a, a amateurish painting is if it looks like every color was used in the box and nothing was mixed. It just really takes away a lot from the painting. But that's not standing up though, so I might have to. So if I need to add something in. I need to make a plan, and if I'm going to use that color, let's blot the, that out because that's not working. Um, I'm going to have to figure out some other places to do it. So, if I use this color here, I'm running out of spaces to mix, and I use a little bit of that, then we'll need to add it elsewhere. So let's get that. Yep, look at look at how that stands out. That looks really nice. Okay, so now I need to find other places to use it. And I think the best places to use it would be in the center of these these flowers. So I'm going to dab some in. And one, two, three. That gives me three places for it. I think, you know, I'm going to do a little bit here and a little bit over here. 
Boy, that is opaque. See how that cadmium, I believe it's cadmium red. Uh, and now I'll grab some of the yellow. And I'll dab that next to it, let the colors merge. And that will, that will give me enough of that color elsewhere so that it won't feel like, why the heck is she adding that color? That doesn't belong there. It just helps make it a little more natural looking. And then I can always add that to the blue, make a dark shadow for something. Um, I'll just need to keep in mind that that's a color I'm allowing now and add to it. I probably wouldn't have wanted that in the background anyway, just because warm, opaque colors like that tend to make mud in the background. Okay, actually, that'll probably be a good color to mix my nice kind of black area for the cap and the wing. So that'll, that'll work out. That'll work out. It'll be fine. Okay, so now I feel like I kind of want to turn my palette around because I've run out of mixing space. Or maybe I'll just take out the center here and I'll use this interior part for mixing. You know what? I think I could actually push this up and put that right here and then you could still see, well, you can see part of my palette anyway. I'm going to grab the rosy red. Actually, I'll just put it on my palette and then you can see me mix from there. And I'm going to grab some of that mauve. There, I think that's all I need for that right now. And we're going to paint in some of the flowers. I'm going to start with this mauve. Up here, this high one. I'm going to leave some space at the bottom for some green for the to attach to the stem. We'll put some in here. I like to twist my brush around a little bit, use it at different angles. Get a nice loose look here. And again, this is where you can crisp up some of those lines that have gotten a little uh, mixed in with the background when we did the background technique. Our background wash. Just um, basically trying to paint the um, shadows. Get grabbing a little bit more of that mauve. More of like an expression of the uh, flower than the, like a botanical rendering. Okay, now I'm going to clean my brush. Grab some of that rosy red. And put some of that in there too. Now I'm not filling in every bit because I want the uh, I want some of that first wash from our background to show through. Sometimes it's more about what you don't paint than what you do paint. And sometimes I'll kind of squint at my picture and kind of see, okay, what do I like? What feels too done? What don't I like? All right, now I'm going to go in with a sap green. I don't like having my palette out to my, uh, let me tell you, I'm going to move my palette over there. I'm afraid I'm going to drop. I'm going to drop paint where I don't want it. Um, being right-handed, I like my palette to my right. If you're left-handed, you probably want it to your left. The sap green. I'm going to grab a smidgen of that uh, blue and I am going to paint these stems. Get this uh, green part here. And I can also put some other grasses and foliage wherever I feel like I want it. This is this part's completely up to you. Balance out your picture. Figure out what you want. 
you can keep it as loose or as tight as you want it to be. Now I want to mix up a nice dark for the, uh, the eyes and head. And I want to make sure I don't put a lot of water in it, so I've got my rag here. I'm going to start off with my Prussian blue. So I haven't been touching that blue because that was that phthalo blue I grabbed by mistake. So I'm going to grab some Prussian blue and the, the orangey color, the orangey, the cadmium red light, which is a really light, opaque, orangey red. And that's making a really nice black. Nice natural looking black there. And the, I'm going to get a little bit of the, a uh, little bit of the feet because they also, like the claws and stuff, will have that color in there. Get some of the feathers here. I'm putting a lot of detail in. I think I'm going to need to put a little bit more yellow in there just to fill in that area. Uh, I'm going to go up here over the beak. And there's like a little wedge shape of dark. And when you do the eye, just um, if you want to switch to a smaller brush, go ahead, but you basically want to just leave a little highlight in there. So I'm actually resting my hand, my wrist right on the paper. Make sure your paper's dry if you do that. You don't wanna you don't wanna rest it on top of on top of something. You don't wanna smear your paint. So tail go back there now. I see this leg here is in shadow in the back, so I'm gonna get that in there. A little bit of shadow on the leg, a little bit on the back there. Now I'm gonna grab some of that brown that we had used earlier, burnt sienna, and a little bit of the yellow, maybe a little bit of the red. I want this kind of peachy color. And I'm gonna do the rest of the legs. A lot of dabbing, a lot of just um, loose interpretation here. I'm going to go back to lemon yellow and I'm going to put that right above the wing. Fill in that area that didn't have enough in there. Um, and then I'm going to take actually some of that lighter color, that black that I made, but I'm going to add some water to it so it's kind of a gray and I'm going to fill in right there because that looked like it was more of a gray in my photo. And add some back there. Now I'm going to switch to a smaller brush because I want to get that little line between the top and lower beak and I'm afraid that if I do that with my, my larger brush then it's not going to be that great. I did add a little bit of that rose into that mix because it looked a little green to me. And I'm very carefully going to paint that in like that. And I'm just looking at my photo. I will link that reference photo up. It's from Pixabay. I cropped in, so when you look at the photo, you're going to see that the bird is way smaller than I have it. And if you wanted the focus of your painting to be more of the wildflower um, surroundings, absolutely, you can do that. I'm making some mud here. I just need a little bit of a dirty yellow for some uh, detail. And I'm using my liner brush so that I end up, I can do the little feathers. Now keep in mind, this is just a quick demonstration. You could spend um, all day working on this and, and doing a lot of detail, and that is wonderful if you want to do that. This is a springboard for you to learn 
and then you can take it further if you want. And if you do want more in-depth tutorials, I do have that in my course, the uh, watercolor, the um, texture toolbox, feathers, and fowl class. It's got a lot more detail. Now I am going to go and mix up a little bit darker of a color there. I'm going to mix it up with a different brush, a stiffer brush, because um, those fine liners you could end up damaging. So I'm taking my CAD Red. So we are getting a lot of use out of that color. I mean, so we did put it several places so it won't feel kind of out of out of uh, left field. Whoops. And I'm going to grab some of my Prussian Blue. I'm squ I squeeze the water off of my fingers so it will give me just enough water that I can um, that I can work with it. I'm going to grab a little of that mauve off my palette too. That's going to help blacken it a little bit. There we go. You can also use like a really dark purple in place of a black. And if you did the Prussian blue in that mauve color, that would give you that. And with the liner, I'm just throwing in some little uh, kind of hairline feathers. Feeling like you don't really see that much of this leg, but it still feels like it ought to be thicker. So sometimes you paint by feel and you're like, hmm, that doesn't feel right. I need to add something. And that's when you do that. Oh, shoot. I lost my highlight. I can do that with a gel pen though later. Not a worry. Okay. Now the top of the beak's a little bit lighter. We've got some reflection. And I'm going to see if I can scrub that out. Hopefully I've got a little scrubber in my paint bucket here. Yes, I do right here. I'm going to scrubber. So I just want enough uh, moisture on this brush so I can scrub. I'm able to remove some of that color. And if you don't get it all out and you want to hit it with a gel pen or a little pencil or something, you can. There we go. That gives it quite a bit of dimension. See, it just gives it that little bit of a sheen. And let's see, I think I'll take my liner and some of that mauve and just give some like accent lines to find some of the petals, especially on the uh, kind of the flowers right around the bird that are would be a little bit more defined. Basically, I'm kind of doing what I would have done with my pencil, drawing it in. And this is kind of a stylized thing. You can do whatever you want to do. I, I just thought this would just give it a little bit more energy. Get that little bit of sketchiness. And I think I'm going to take some of that brown and some of the sap green and give these stems a little bit more prominence because they are a little bit darker. Okay, so if you want, you can take a color pencil, you could take a paint pen, uh, you could take whatever you want. You can add some accent lines. I'm not sure if mine's dry enough to do that with a colored pencil, but we can give it a try. Try to give you an idea of what you would do. If you look at the reference photo, you could see these little kind of um, white bursts, these streaks. In the background, you can brighten up anything you want. I really like the Prismacolor pencils because they're so um, they're so opaque, not as opaque as a pen, so it's not going to you know be that harsh. But you can brighten stuff up if you want to. You don't have to. It's your choice. And if you want a little, you could do a little highlight on the centers, and of course the eye. I don't know if it's dry enough yet. Oh yeah, we got a little highlight back there. But uh, but there you have it. I will put in a uh, snapshot of the dry painting so you can see it. 
And thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this tutorial and you'd like to see more beginner watercolor tutorials. And if you want more bird tutorials, check out my bird painting class. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.